All right. Hello. Welcome back to another fun-filled episode of the Hammercast. I am your host, Alex, the Hebrew Hammer Salkin. And joining me once more is everybody's favorite strength coach extraordinaire, Dan John, author of all of your favorite books on strength training. I know this to be a fact. And we are going to be talking about, he's got a couple of new books that have come out. The most recent one is The Armor Building Formula, and it is phenomenal. And there's a bunch of stuff that I think helps it to stand out head and shoulders above a lot of the other books that I have read and a lot of the other materials that I've read on muscle building. And uh, we're going to talk uh, in depth about that as well as a couple of other fun and salient topics. And before we do, I am going to remind my listeners that if you have not already, be sure to go get my free nine-minute kettlebell and bodyweight challenge. It is, as the name implies, only nine minutes to do. And I designed it specifically so that it can be done in conjunction with any other training that you're doing because it is based around filling in a pretty important gap in your training, which is strengthening your gait pattern. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that loaded carries make a pretty important uh, appearance in there. And given that we've got the man, uh, the myth, the legend of uh, loaded carries himself, Dan John here, seems salient to mention that, as well as things like crawling, dead bugs, and the other kind of stuff that have a nice carryover into your training without completely zapping you of your energy. So you can get that at 9minutechallenge.com and uh, have a good old time in the process. So it's the number nine minutechallenge.com. So without further ado, Dan, welcome back to the podcast. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been a while. When's the last time I saw you physically? It seems like uh, if I said a decade, I might be wrong, but it's It's, been a while. It's not far from that. I'm trying to think. uh, I know for a fact, in person, we saw this. Actually, this would be a decade ago. This would be the um, reasonableness workshop in Exton, Pennsylvania in 2014 for Pat's kettlebell surge. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it's hard to believe, you know, cause especially cause it's like, it seems like every so often, you know, I'm either uh, on Pat's podcast with you or I'm tuning in with you. So yeah. it feels like it's a weekly occurrence. It doesn't feel like yeah. 10 years have gone by. Yeah. That's funny. And Exton was that. So we had a couple of really good workshops in that area. And then when the, uh, was this after the strong first RKC divorce or was that? It was because I think that happened in like, 2012 so it would have been 2014 that was the reasonableness work yeah okay yeah because yeah. uh we were doing those easy strength workshops in that same area yeah Man, we're good but hey you know uh you know if if you're not divisive you're not 2024 you know i know it's so weird it, like every time i i uh I almost wonder if I'm missing out a little bit because I I always try to contextualize. So when somebody asks me a question about something fitness related, you know, you know this. Generally, the answer is not yes or no, right or wrong. As you like to say, it's it depends. And I I think it's so true. And so trying to contextualize it, it automatically drops the drama levels down. And the people who are attracted to that, they seem to like to wander off to somebody who will give them that drama that they're looking for. Yeah. Black and white, and it's funny, you know, from my theology background, either or is always the simplest and most wrong answer, you know, and that's why, I mean, somebody will ask me about some world event, it'll be like, you, you really want to know? I mean, because I have a master's in histories, I have a master of religious education, I have, you know, I have, I've I've been all through these areas where the, uh, the, these events are happening. Do what, where do you want me to discuss? Uh, do, am I, am I, yeah. Oh, oh, you just want a simple answer? Oh, they'll then just go to Facebook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There are plenty of people giving them out for free. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's as simple as that. And by the way, how ironic, you black and white being the simplest and most wrong form of thinking. You're wearing a black shirt and I'm wearing a white shirt. It was, we didn't plan this, folks. This just oh, happened. we did. Don't, don't. That's huh. He called me. We've been spending hours, uh, you know, talking about our, our color scheme here. And there's my, you know, there's my chessboard. There you go. Right there. Yeah, I like it. There you go. I like that a lot. We should have worn gray shirts. That would have been the the ideal, you know? So, yes, yes, the, yes. The most boring. Yeah, find something boring. Yes. So, all right, let's kick this thing off. Let's. Yes, uh, yes. Well, you know, I had to say one of the things that I'm really enjoying about this book, I, I've been more and more interested in the topic of building muscle over the last couple of yeah. years. And. I, you know, I've found that I think I've distilled things down in such a way that I kind of have a better understanding of the the deeper machinations of how to build muscle. And something that you talked about at that uh, reasonableness workshop all those years ago, 
really stuck with me, and that was look at what all the experts agree on. Don't look at like what they disagree on because there's plenty of that. Look at what they all agree on. And from that, I think it's easy to glean a lot of great information from the armor building formula. So um, in particular, you know, one of the things you mentioned is on page 43 is the importance of having a goal. You know, you, you say oh. no matter what your your physical or athletic ambition is, start with a goal and then you work backwards and figure out how you're going to get there. What is your goal for those who read the book? And, like, what do you hope that they'll get out of it, even above and beyond just the program itself? Well, isn't that interesting? I, I you know, I've been doing this a, wrong t a long time, and that is the first time this question's ever been asked. Uh, what what it, what do I want the reader to go, what their goal to be? Because yeah. I get texts and emails and phone calls and, you know, internet and, yeah. you know, hands-on stuff. And it's always, Dan, we want a bodybuilding program. And so I put together one that I thought was, you know, reasonable, doable, uh, you know, all the words I said 10 years ago in, yeah. in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, a normal person can do it, fit it into their schedule. And I, I think... For me, and, and as you know, you know, I always break things down to those five big categories. Mm -hmm. Health, number one, and that's the mafitones, the, the, the optimal interplay of the human organs. You know, yeah. liver is liver and your lungs are lungy. Okay. Then there's this concept called longevity. And I like Rob Wolf's idea. Live long, drop dead. I think, you know, as best you, know, as best you can. Uh, fitness, ability to do a task, performance. Someone says your name and you do something. And then there's this thing called body composition. So when I look at all the things we do in the world of health and fitness, those, those five terms make a, those are my, that's the geography, okay? That's the map, okay? That's that's the big picture of stuff. I think the best way to be able to have at some level a quality life that engages all five of those realms, mm -hmm. it's going to be the basic stuff. You need, I think you need to sleep eight or nine hours, Okay. Uh, now, there's going to be a listener who says, I only need three minutes. Okay, good for you. The rest of us need internet. You should drink water. You should eat protein. You should eat vegetables. Probably should go for a walk. Um, I go to the senior center a lot. I, I I volunteer at the senior center. And I also go, last night, it was every Thursday night, they have this nice little, it's a great, it's a dance. They call it the dance, but it's a lot of fun. And the person who runs it, Maureen, uh, she's been around a long time. The secret to aging is moving and community. Mm -hmm. So for almost everything I said, it's movement and community. Mm -hmm. When you read Peter Atiyah's book, it's exercise. When you read Longevity by Sinclair, it's exercise. When you read Bob Arnott's book on turning back the clock, exercise, 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 exercise. Outside of sleep, protein, veggies, water, community, it's exercise, exercise, exercise. So one of the things th that we know is we know that strain and it, you, strength span, I know the new word now, so there was lifespan when I was younger, then it became health span. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that term is almost 80 years old. Uh, that's from uh, some German studies in the forties and fifties. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly brand new, but I, uh, I like the concept of strength span because we know that if you can keep if you can get your strength levels up in your middle years, anywhere from 35 to 55, no, 35 to 55, we'll just leave it right there, and get stronger, even if you stop training, you're still going to have a bit more of a gap than someone who didn't. Mm -hmm. So the number one thing I would say in a book like this is that I think I can cover strength just by saying lift weights. Mm -hmm. But then there's its friend that needs to be considered, which is lean body mass. So we know that obesity epidemic is real. I personally blame, I blame ultra processed foods more than anything else. I'll be honest with you. I, I can't, I'm exhausted. Take the knife out of my chest. I can't keep fighting the good fight. It's crap food, folks. Stop yeah. eating crap food. You know, it just if we can just get, stop. It's terrible for you. And it's worse than we think. I just read a thing that 70% of the English diet is ultra processed food. And it's real hard to stay ahead on that. Um, so I think with the obesity epidemic, we can deal with it with some interventions uh, 
it would be nice if the government would step in, but by God, I just might as well just threw gasoline on my lawn. You know, I just killed <laughs> a whole bunch of your listeners just switched off. Ah, oh, the government. But personal choice is important. But on when it comes to lean body mass, besides the obesity issue, which is at the kitchen table, exercise. Mm-hmm. And I think at some level, we need to think in our lives to do two things at once. You need to be, uh, or one, you need to be a 1950s bodybuilder, someone who trains for strength and for shape, whatever you want to call shape. I like, I'm starting to say shape more and more lately because I don't necessarily want you to look like you're, you know, I don't want you to look like you're ripped for some bodybuilding contest. But what I'd like you to have is good proportions, you know, Art Devaney's X look. I've always thought that was a great way. Uh, that would be broad shoulders, narrow waist, and then, you know, legs that are worthy of the title. Uh, there's a guy I just saw uh, a couple of days ago. Um, he missed the whole memo about working your legs. He's walking around in a, in a restaurant with his tank top on. He's all veined up, but he's also wearing shorts. And if I was training a 13 year old girl as an athlete with his legs, I would be concerned about her ability set. Yeah. So, so men work your legs there. So this book and my concept now is that we, we need to have a good set of tools to, to keep up our lean body mass, but at the same time, have some strength and some fast twitch or some explosive ballistic work. Okay. That's, when you do clean and press uh, in the barbell or kettlebell or, or dumbbell or whatever um, desk, <laughs> um, that will actually, in my opinion, just doing the clean and press will give you enough of that fast twitch fiber to keep you going. Mm-hmm. It might not make you an Olympic lifter or a world-class sprinter, but it's enough to get you to jump up on a curb or avoid a rattlesnake, you know. Definitely. So is that okay? Is that a good start? So it's a great start. And you know, one of the things you mentioned a couple things in there that I think are great points to expand on. And one of the first ones that I want to talk about is those the big five categories that you talked about. Oh, yeah. And you know, somebody pointed this out recently, and I thought that this was a it was a physical therapist that I um, I was talking to, and one of the things that he said was that he had um uh, i think he he had had some sort of like a mycotoxin reaction to like mold in his house this is when he was very very young and so he yeah. had like symptoms of arthritis and other things like that and his doctors were just like well you know you're just effed up you got to get used to it and, sorry yeah and so uh now he was able to uh to fix it but again the part of the problem was getting rid of the problem you got to get rid of the, the mold and the you know the other issues that he had and his it, what he said was you know we've got such great something to this effect, I'm going to be paraphrasing, but he said like, you know, we've got such great and in-depth knowledge in Western medicine, but the problem is that there are all these specialties that very often don't talk to each other. And so the stuff that um, if they were to have bridges between them so they could say, you know, I know a lot in this specialty, but I also know what I don't know. So go talk to so-and-so or go talk to, you know, I think that we're starting to see kind of maybe subconsciously a lot of people in the fitness industry starting to understand that too. And so becoming less and less specialized and understanding that getting generally strong, generally help, uh, healthy, generally oh, thick. I, yes. This is, is really going to be the key to health. And you talk about this in your book because you said, look, this program is not, you're probably not going to end up getting gold on a stage. You're probably not going to be a medalist in the Olymp- in uh, Olympic lifting, but that's not the whole point. You know, the point is that you can live your life and enjoy it and also make sure that you are taking care of these, these issues that you're having. And I really thought that that's one of the, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways from the book. And this isn't even me giving everything away. This is like, you know, barely scratching the surface, but um, I think your philosophy shows up very, very well in that regard, because (laughs) that's something that, I think a lot of people in the fitness world kind of tried to mirror for a very long time. Like I'm a kettlebell guy. I'm a strength guy. I'm a runner type of guy, or I'm a bodybuilding guy, but people understanding you need it all. Yeah. Well, I I like that because above me there, those magazines are called strength and health. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I read strength and health magazine. And when you read a magazine called strength and health, it, 
over time, and they and they did. They were very good about. They would have an article about sun tanning, but they would always, and obviously they were selling products and stuff. But I always liked it because I always thought they had a balanced look. Sun tanning is good for you. Sun burning is bad for you. And it's it, well, there's a great that's a great metaphor for life, by the way. But um, I it, it's very difficult to to get this across to people. I hope I do. But you're right. I. Uh, I'll I'll be at a party and someone says, "Hey Dan, I, you know you're a fitness guy. Help me lose a few pounds." And I'll just look and it's like, "Damn, dude! I mean, uh, when's the last time I'll say, when's the last time you went to a dentist?" Instant pushback. Yeah, you floss your teeth every day, and everyone jokes about my flossing teeth thing, but I'm very serious about it. If you floss your teeth, according to my dental hygienist, you are one in twenty of her clients. Wow. Don't forget, those are the one in 20 who go to the dentist. Yeah. So I got, God only knows what it is, you know, with the general pop. And, you know, I, so you can't, you can't floss your teeth that, but you think you're all of a sudden just going to flip a switch on, you know, like a wall switch. And all of a sudden, well, I'm going to cut out all these foods. I'm going to train with Alex every day. I'm going to listen to Dan's podcast while I'm doing my whatever the hell it is, you know. And 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 it's weird. And that's why, and this is going to sound horrible. Folks, I'm not giving up on you. But I'm starting to realize only one in 20 Americans floss. Only one in 20 Americans work out. Mm -hmm. I, I can't keep trying to convert the 19 out of 20. Yeah. Most most Americans don't read books after they graduate from high school. So, and I write books, so I guess I'm, a, you know, I you, you can only you, you, it, it's a phrase my 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 mom used to say, and it's weird because one of my mentors used to to say it too. You serve whoever shows up. Mm -hmm. So, and and there's a there's a there's a great Bible story about it, but it my point is. Whoever, you know, whoever shows up to my gym, I coach. Whoever shows up at the university I coach at gets coached by me. Yeah. And if you can't make the practice, I can't coach you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I realized kind of early on that I had such enthusiasm for what I was doing that I, I, a lot of times my enthusiasm outpaced that of the people who reached out to me. Like I, I mean, I would do stuff like, I remember one time somebody asked about kettlebells. This was very early on in my own kettlebell journey where most people hadn't heard of it. And he was like, yeah, you know, I'm kind of interested in maybe, you know, maybe trying out some kettlebells. Or like, come over sometime. I will teach you for free. What's your address? I will send you this DVD of the kettlebell. Yes. And like never heard from him again. He was like, you know, I was just like came on too strong. But I was just so pumped to try to spread the message. But then you do also realize that, you know, sometimes, you know, People are tangentially interested. And then it's like, once they show up, if they show up, usually you can kind of get them to start taking the baby steps and then they want to take the next ones. If yeah. they don't even want to show up, you got to, you can't let your enthusiasm outpace theirs. You got to direct that to those who are really serious about training and about getting better. Oh. I mean, you kind of just nailed my career. The first time I, I retired as a coach was 1991. I don't know if you know. Yeah, 1991. Well, or 90 or 91. I just was done with it, okay? And so I got a phone call from a friend of mine. And she said, my son wants to throw the discus. And I said, okay. And then so I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go help him. And, uh, and I'm going to give him some materials. And I'm going to tell him what to do. And it's on his plate. So I gave him 75 pages of discus material. It was just stuff I had. I had these copies. And then I showed him this stuff and I said, when you read everything and throw the discus full turn a thousand times, then I'll give you the next thing. Three days later, I get a phone call. Hey, dude, this is Paul. I'm finished. And that was my 1996 national champion who I talked with last night. Wow. And he is the young man that got me back in. He is the one that made me realize that with most people, I mean, it, I might as well be speaking another way. A wah wah, a wah wah, wah wah, wah wah. You know the uh, yeah. Charlie Sleep Brown character, yeah, yeah. The the Charlie Brown adult. Wah, 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 yeah. wah, 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 wah. And he's the one that changed it. And so what I'm trying to do, 
I call it the Murtaugh law. I, I'm getting too old for this stuff. That's how they said it in the yeah. how I met my mother. I'm just getting too old for this. Okay. It so now I I feed those who come, man. I just yeah. And, you know, I'll go on, I'll go on these websites and people say terrible things about me. It kind of hurts my feeling, you know, uh, it almost hurts it. I really, you know, but, uh, and then I'll look and it, and, and, and I'm always, it's always funny because the person's been on the forum, you know, you can, you can usually read their thing. They've been on the forum two months, go back and read their first thing. I'm brand new to kettlebells or, and then two months later, they're ripping on me, Pavel, you, you know, Pat Flynn, yeah. because their guru, uh, you know, uh, in my gym when workout's over, we always go, not today. Um, <laughs> but uh, oh, I should. I know it's inappropriate, uh, but it's funny. It's, 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 it's funny. Okay. It's, it's Laugh. Welcoming. It's welcome. So, you know, even, even when people get involved, even then they still want to find a tribe to belong to. Yeah. And the truth is the tribe you belong to is probably your family, your local community. And part of the reason, you know, you know about was my last couple of years been kind of crappy, right? Yeah, yeah. Started with lost my brother. And then of course Tiffany died and almost lost Sirius the same week. And my dog, and like, come on, Sirius Black, don't do that to me. Um it, I was about to make a point and I I sidetracked. I apologize. It'll come right back to me. Of course. Um, damn, why did I lose my point? I do it all the time. You're in good company, Dan. Okay. But it was going to be about the idea that, you know, this this idea that, you know, I, I, mean, I know. So right now, as in, in, in real time, I've already prepaid for my funeral, prepaid for my graveyard, uh, gravesite. I've already, uh, already, my last will and testament is up to date by the minute. Uh, I'm doing all these things so that my daughters don't have the burden of it when I slide over. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's why you do things. And uh, that's why when they were little, I invested in their college. And that's why, and that's what we need to do. And so one of the things I'd like to really emphasize for your listeners, man, is that sometimes you do things like clean and presses and mobility work. You do them for your kids and grandkids so you're able your quality of life has a massive imp impact on the quality of life of people in your community so you're not just how old are you now Alex? 37. okay i know I'm, i don't look a day above 17. i've got that baby face going yeah, on still but i'm 67 so 30 years older than you you know let's tag 30 years on both of us ideally we're having this conversation still absolutely and uh, I, I want to make sure that I have some fast twitch muscle fiber so that if I slip, I catch myself. I want to be able to get up and I want to wipe myself. I want to be all those things. And that's why I think sometimes these programs that beat the living hell out of you don't look at Danny 30 years from now. Don't yeah. look at the at the hammer 30 years from now. Yeah. Big time. Yeah, I always make it a point that over the years, I've realized, um, you know, if you give people the option to do, let's say, mobility or stretching or the original strength resets and stuff like that, they won't do them. So if you make it a part of the program, because, you know, I sell my own fair share of online, you know, courses yeah. and programs, but I make it, I build it in so that it's not like, here's your warm up, and now you can ignore all, once you've done that, you can ignore all the stuff that's good for you. It's like, it's like a dish where the vegetables are mixed in, like you can't pick it out. You, you have to do uh, written. Why I love soups and stews. Exactly. Yeah, because, you know, when I'm, I, I have a chicken noodle soup that has no noodles. It's all just vegetables, you know, and your daughters can't just eat the noodles. And, you know, uh, yeah, that's really a good way to look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. No, my pleasure. And I, I think that that's the key is that, you know, you, you made a great point about the flossing thing. It's like one in 20 of the people who should even show up to the dentist at your dental hygienist office will, will even bother to floss. That doesn't speak to the people who, who won't do it at all. But, you know, the people who do show up, you still want to make sure that, okay, they've done the most important part. You know, some would say that's like 80%. You just show up and then yeah. even do a little bit. It's like, it, it's never been it's never been easier to be extraordinary because a lot of times people just don't even want to show up now you know they or they want to try to find that 
the what do you call it like the hack exactly there's a thing called hacks it's like dude you already won you you flossed your teeth it means literally you're better than 95 percent of the people you know yeah and when i said better i actually mean that uh you are uh you read a book yeah well you're awesome you know you're, you're you don't have to it, when i go on these like that was kind of easing off the hackers thing right mm -hmm. uh, i love hack how to get through a book in 12 minutes well why would you want to get through a great book in 12 minutes yeah you know uh, if i like a book i might read it shoot if i like a book like sword in the stone i might read it well, once a year since i was 10 at yeah. least yeah those are the kind of things that stick with you you know and yeah and the real the real key is that i like to the way that i like to look at it when it comes to the training stuff is that if you've got the stuff that they need built into the stuff that they want suddenly the stuff that they need is stuff that they really enjoy because like they experience it and it's not like you know it's not like the first time you eat a healthy meal and if you work out for the first time, you're like, I'm a little bit sore. I'm sweaty. I feel good. You don't get the same thing from eating well just at one time, but you do it enough. And you're like, wow, I feel great. I've got more energy. I'm leaner. You know, that lady was looking at me at the store today, whatever the case may be. It's like, you, but you have to do it enough where you can feel the difference. And so by, by putting the vegetables in with the meat makes it a lot easier for people to be like, aha, the big difference here was not just you know, doing these mobility drills and not just doing the strength work. It's the fact that I did them together and sped up the whole process. And, you know, this is something you talk about too in, in the armor building formula. You've got focus on like, you talk about the original strength resets, which are like a game changer, you know? Unbelievable. Uh, yeah. And you talk about uh, mobility and like, and those sorts of things. And I hope that when people read it, they won't take that lightly. I hope that they'll see that as like, that's essential. It's not just enough to lift weight. You also want to move pretty well too. I, I I have an entire book called Can You Go based on the idea of giving people what they need and what they want. Yeah. Organizing training systems. Uh, one of the things I do, in fact, my workout today, I mean, look, you know, I'm 67. I mean, doing well. And so, you know, I'm getting ready for an Olympic lifting meet. So my workout today between I was, I'm, I'm trying to really increase my uh, military press again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Partially because of the books and everything, but just, it's, yeah, it's just, it's, I like the way I feel when I military press. So I, today I did uh, 10 sets of two with a, a heavy weight mm -hmm. in between sets. I did one of the original uh, strength exercises that we call fro zones. Uh, it's this six, it's a bird dog, but you throw your hand backward and you, oh, yeah. it's, like you're, it's like you're speed skating, uh, on the floor. I love those. And then after that, I would jump up on the bar and do bent, uh, hanging bent knee leg raises. Mm -hmm. So between every set of press, every set of press, I was on the floor and I was hanging. And then I'd press on the floor for 10 rounds. And when I do that, when people say, well, where, you know, why do you sweat when you work out? It's like, well, pressing is this level, frozone's that level, hanging is that level. I change levels every every round. And I do it because I'm 67. And at my age, the most dangerous thing in my home is the floor. Yeah. You know, what ultimately killed, I mean, what killed Tiffany was a fall. And here I you've you've heard me say talk about fall and fall prevention. Oh yeah. And, you know, it's, it's a serious thing. I mean, at the, at the senior center, you know, we'll have these conversations about someone who fell and, you know, and at, you know, I was at a, a lunch not long ago and, and they were telling about a friend of ours who fell. And there's that quiet moment where we all kind of do the math and realize that, you know, so what you need to do, gentle listener, is you probably need to work your glutes, your posture you're getting on the floor you should walk that's what you need to do and now the cute stuff what you what you want to do oh we'll just sprinkle that in and you'll love me for it mm -hmm. but between what you want to do i'm going to make sure you do what you need to do and yeah. and i'm doing it as a as an act of kindness truly oh yeah you know that's the other thing is 
I wanted to mention this earlier because I, I think you'll I think you'll agree with me on this. It's why it's so hard to get people to do walking original strength. You know what? Actually, original strength. I've had pretty good luck getting people to do it because it seems like exercise, but it's kind of like this different category of quote unquote exercise where it's it's just so much closer to the stuff that we do naturally and it's not as distilled and refined and and polished. Um, so people are, but it looks enough like exercise. People are willing to give it a shot and then test and retest. And then they see some results and then they're excited because they, oh, I'm getting fast results. I've hacked my training. I'm yeah. super pumped. Um, but yeah, the walking, eating protein, drinking water, you know, like that's the hard stuff to get people to, to hear. But it seems like once they kind of start to get the ball rolling with the cool stuff, you know, like the, uh, they're doing the kettlebell work or the calisthenics drills or what have you, um, then they can start to put that other stuff in the background. And I think the reason why is because I don't remember who said it, but somebody said, we're no longer in the information age. We're in the entertainment age. And people want entertainment m more than anything. It's like it's on your phone. You mind if I just took a second to... Uh, yeah, please, by all means. Uh, shoot. Bye. Everything I have is 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 workout stuff, so I, I have to. Likewise, I, I, let me show you. I've got my notepad here. It's always got tons of notes, thoughts, ideas, et cetera, et cetera. So but not the information age. Not any longer. No, now we're in the entertainment age. It used to be you wanted to see a movie. You went to the movie theater or maybe on a Friday night, your dad took you to Blockbuster, you know, you and your yeah. My brother and I were always so excited when that we would we would get like the same like Chris Farley best of yeah. set SNL you know like a, yeah. a blockbuster like every couple of weeks and that's what we love and now it's like you've got YouTube there are like hundreds of millions of videos you've got so, God knows I how went, many services I went and saw Fall Guy a couple oh about a week or so ago yeah. and when I got home I turned on my computer and it was on Prime no kidding I was like wait what I. It, and it weirdly it was cheaper to watch it on Prime than wow. it was to go to the theater. Yeah. See, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, and by I, I like the movie. Uh, this hi, so where Siskel and Eve, or the, the Hammer and Dan, the Hammer and Dan, ninety-seven point four in the mornings. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're, but I, yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you, and that's one of the reasons. By the way, I, I went to go. I'm going back. I went back consciously two years ago. I now go to movies. Mm -hmm. Consciously, I am now going back to uh, musicals, uh, to performances, because I'm trying to break that habit of mine. Uh, the other day, I was somewhere, and uh, something came up, and I said, I, I don't know. And someone says, well, why don't you just Google it on your phone? I go, I don't bring my phone with me. And they said, really? And then I said, famously, probably pissed off everyone listening, I'm not a 14-year-old girl. You know, I don't, I don't need to be, to have every question I have. Do you mind if I just talk about that real quick? Please go for it. It's a concept Nick Peterson, uh, I read in his book. Uh, I actually, I read in his newsletter and I think it's, it's open loop versus closed loop. Mm -hmm. The old NLP. Okay. Yeah. And if I say to you, um, you know, who, run, who won the 1956 uh, middleweight uh, Olympic championship? I think it's Tommy Kono. Okay, but if I but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So right now, as we're sitting here looking at each other, I think it's Tommy Kono. And after we hang up, I'm gonna probably go to his book and see if he actually. Did. I think I'm right, mm -hmm. but my loop remains open. Yeah. And so Tommy Kono is up in uh, the great Olympic lifter Tommy Kono is in my head right now, and I am my brain is digesting this, and I'm gonna get the answer. And close the loop. Mm -hmm. But if I just close the loop for you, then it's closed. Yeah. You know, what's the capital of uh, Vermont? It's Montpelier. Well, okay. Now, if there's a test, you have to memorize it. Sure. Yeah. So one of the things I, 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 I like this idea about the entertainment age versus the information age, because, you know, as a discus thrower, you come to me as a discus thrower, I kind of have the answers for you. But you're 15,000 turns a year, 15,000 reps to understanding it a year for eight to 10 years. So 
Yeah. So that I get this is actually I know we're not uh, we're kind of went off track, but actually I think we're on the right track here. I think we are. Because people come to me at parties and they want me to close the loop for them. They say, Dan, I need to lose a few pounds. But they know what I'm going to tell them already. That, but they but they then think because I have I make a lot of money and I'm famous doing this, and I, I'm sure that sounded really full of myself, but you know, that's true. That I have some fast track, some some cheat to doing it. Um, the two of us probably know how to get to the moon. That you and I, if the two of us sat down, we could probably organize through other people's work how to get to the moon. Now, building the systems, rocket, craft, landing craft, return craft. Someone to pick us up when we drop in the ocean. That's very important, by the way. That last little bit, having someone pick you up, the uh, the Uber aircraft. <laughs> As we're going, you know, you're on Uber. Uh, we need an aircraft carrier. At yeah. Well, I would be because you wouldn't bring your phone with you. So I would have my this phone. This is true. This is I true. Would... Yeah, this is true. The whole time. And, and, and I wouldn't take pictures either. I'd be more like in the experience, man. Exactly. Um, just because we, we know something, it's the doing is radically different. So when I'm at a party and someone asks a question, they generally know the answer. Man, it's the doing. It's the doing. And that's that's why I, I'm especially, it's funny you mentioned this book, because what I try to do is give the most basic thing. Here, two exercises in the barbell program at first. You know, very few exercises in the, the kettlebell program. I think two. I give you options, but there's really just two. Mm -hmm. And uh, four, I guess, but more than Chris. Don't let me. Now go do it. Well, what about this, this, and this? I know you didn't do it because those questions would have been answered by putting your hands on the bar. Yeah. You know, I heard something very interesting yesterday. I was listening to a talk that was given by a guy named Dan Kennedy. who's was a very well-known model. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. He said something. It was like a revelation. Like, I wish I hadn't been driving because I would have written it out. I have to go back yeah. and like re-listen. But he said, um, one of the things that you want to be he was kind of like poking fun at the idea of some of these companies requiring like a master's degree in order to be the vice president of a marketing firm. He's like, I don't have a master's degree. And he's like, people pay me a lot more than they're paying any of those people. He's like, Guthy Ranker doesn't have a master's degree. All these other people don't have master's degrees um, and people are uh, pay us good money. So it's like, it, it's clear that there's not a direct connection. He said, I think the, the peril, he's like, and you're going to have this no matter what, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, the peril is that um, there's, there's knowledge that comes from information. I think this is how he said it, meaning you get your master's or your PhD, and now you have knowledge from the information you've studied, but then there's knowledge from experience. And it's possible that knowledge from experience can still blind you because then you don't want to hear anybody else's experience. You don't want to hear any, uh, any studies, but the same thing is also true on the information side. So it's like, both have their advantages and both have their disadvantages. And so, you know, he said, this is why when I take on a new client, even though I've got a lot of experience in their field, I'll ask them for 12 months of trade journal so that I can read up on what, you know, what's going on, what the data says, all this other stuff. Uh, but that's, it's equally huge with, with uh, people when it comes to exercise, because they do know, I call it the gun to the head test. They ask that question. And then you put a theoretical gun to their head, not a real one, folks, please don't, you know, don't do this at home um, and ask, OK, well, you tell me what you think the answer is. And they'll probably be pretty close to correct, but they don't have the experiential knowledge to give them the confidence to take those steps. You know, I mentioned Rob Wolf earlier and years ago I was teaching high school. I was coaching. I was coaching and teaching in high school. And Rob and I just had this conversation. He said, it's interesting about nutrition. And I go, what? He goes, ask your kids about vitamin C. And I go, okay. So I go in the gym next thing. Anyone know what a, a vitamin C is? A sort hand goes up, ascorbic acid. And, oh, good. Oh, I got, oh, okay. And what does it do? Prevent scurvy. Oh. And then Rob said, and then the follow-up answer, where do you find it? So in the nutrition classes that they're at, they were learning all the vitamins, pro, pro hormones. Mm -hmm. uh, they were learning all this stuff, but they probably couldn't go upstairs and make a healthy meal. Yeah. Um, 
they had a lot of information, but they hadn't had the formation. That's actually interesting because you've just summarized my entire career. So my whole career has been on that uh, form. Uh, I'm not certified to be able to coach the discus and the other throws. And yet uh, it's a rare person that would say to me, uh, we're going to go with, you know, I don't want to make a big deal, but the Hebrew hammer is certified to coach the discus. So we're going to go to him because he went to a two hour lecture yeah. and filled a piece of paper and paid 25 bucks. I've never done that because I tried one time, but it was, they were talked about how to hold the discus for like an hour. And I thought the turn makes the discus go far. Not, yeah, not the holding. it. Holding is the easy part. The, yeah. the, that's the tough part. Formation is the key. I like that. So, and then you fall into some holes with information because if you didn't, if you're not taking that material and then bring it in into your life, the experience, then you're struggling. And even then, you watch Stanley Tucci show on uh, that great CNN two year thing on cooking in Italy, mm -hmm. and you realize that even regionally, they do this with garlic there and they do that with garlic here. Mm -hmm. So even though you thought you knew about garlic, you only touch the surface of garlic. Yeah. Yeah. Which always amazes me how someone can be an expert by just watching uh, videos on, on online. I don't know how you would. Because if you're not lifting weights, swinging a bell, throwing a discus, knocking people down or raising them. Yeah. I'm going to learn. I'm going to raise a child by watching, reading books and watching uh, YouTube videos on how to raise a kid. Yeah. At three in the morning when a kid's been screaming for six hours. I don't know where that YouTube channel is that helps you then. Yeah. 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 I, it reminds me of there's a, uh, you know, a lot of people didn't like Indiana Jones and the kingdom of the crystal skull. I thought it was entertaining. I mean, it certainly yeah. wasn't as good as the original. Oh yeah. But it was but, entertaining. Yeah. But it was entertaining. And there's a scene where there's some, uh, I think they're trying to escape the, these, uh, it was Indiana Jones and his, as he would find out later, his son, Oh, yeah. uh, we're on a motorcycle and they're trying to escape from these guys who are trying to capture them or something like that. And they end up bursting into the library. And most people are like dumbfounded. And then one of the students looks up and he sees Dr. Jones as professor. He says, Dr. Jones, I had a question about such and such, like, you know, completely oblivious to the fact that he's on a motorcycle or something crazy just happened. And he said, uh, he said something like a get out of the library and get into the field because that's where that's where all the real answers are. Something to that effect. And then they, you know, triumphantly ride off and they escape their, their, their would-be captors. Yeah. And that's really what it takes. Like uh, Cliff Harsky had a great uh, yeah. post recently on, on Instagram. He said, you know what? If you offer online training, but you have not spent a good amount of time training people in person, I don't think I can take your opinion seriously because there's, there's no experience behind them. It's like you might know canned answers, but... It does, but it doesn't come from experience. It comes from something that you read or that you heard. It's a completely different type of, of knowledge. It could be right, but you don't have the experience to know for a fact that it's going to be right. Uh, so I've had 200 people on a field and I've taught them the discus by myself. Now we also had helpers. Mm -hmm. If you can teach 65 sophomore boys how to squat, then I'll listen to your opinion about how to squat. Yeah. Because when you can stay on track, synthesize, be clear, move along, uh, deal with all the stuff that goes on. I mean, teaching school, you know, we had fire drills. We did have an active shooter one time. Wow. We had suicides. We had student deaths, faculty deaths prom and pregnancies and world problems i mean nine you know 9 11 and the challenger disaster those were in real time you know if you but you can still coach the squad or deadlift through all i mean every day you're just you're just waiting for that other shoe to drop yeah i, I like that point as i recall he's a good dude too right he's, he's great very smart got a very uh unique approach to training and it's one that I think fills in a lot of gaps that a lot of other people um, leave behind. And one of the things is that, you know, uh, he's very good about this. It's like figuring out 
uh, how to do more with what you've already got. And meaning like you got one kettlebell. Okay. So like, you're not limited. You've got like, what are your other options? Like, what are some of the other things that you can do? You've got a hinge movement. How many different ways can you hinge? How many different ways can you squat? And, and, you know, I think the practical approach that he takes too is very good. Like realistically speaking, you know, okay. When you go to a certification, it's like you're talking with other trainers, but then you're going to go out and you're going to talk with people who just want to look better naked and feel better and feel more confident. So how can you, how can you make your training something that is going to be oriented toward that as opposed to the PR or ER approach that a lot of us like to take, you know, when it comes to lifting and being like, maybe I'm going to hit a PR, maybe I'll pass out halfway through because the weight is so heavy. It's like people who just want to look better and feel better, yeah. they're not as concerned with that. You know? Yeah. And there was, there's, there is a joke in strength and conditioning about the fear of the athletes when the coach goes to a workshop. Yeah. Because, you know, on Monday, the coach will say, forget everything I taught you. Now we're going to, you know, all we're doing is Turkish get-ups. That's all we're going to do every day for an hour. Cause I went to a workshop on yeah. the Turkish get-up, you know, and a week later, uh, there's a famous story. I want to say it's in the track and field Omni book, but this coach went to a workshop and found out someone said that the 200 meter interval was the perfect thing to train in track and field. So the coach came up with the program where all they did was run repeat 200 meters. And at the end of two weeks, he didn't have a team anymore. Can't imagine why. Great workshop, probably a pretty good idea, but it doesn't work in the real world. Unless you're in a, you know, you're working in one of those countries like Russia or China, where, you know, like you said, a gun to the head, where you, you're you one step from a gun to the head, you know. Well, you can, and in some can afford to throw tons of human misery at their athletes because they're there for one reason, and that's to bring glory to the nation, you know, and, not to feel good. And their family, so their family can eat. Yeah, so. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's a lot of ideas that sound nice. I find this in my own training. Like today I had a, I had a training session that I was supposed to do, but I haven't slept all that well the last two nights. And, uh, it was like, I just don't have the, you know, I, I looked at the volume because I had never really added it up. I'm like, that's kind of a lot of reps. Maybe I need to rethink what I'm doing here because even if I could conceivably get it done, if I've got a snort ammonia and like hit my head against the wall, yeah, maybe I'm going the wrong direction. And, you you nailed it then and oddly so when things are going wrong sometimes the thing you need is a as a walk yeah the thing you need is a sauna a walk followed by a sauna well well that's not very intense yeah well i want to be i want to you know i started lifting weights in 1965 i've had some workouts that are really really hard but the workouts that keep me going are, are the ones that you know, if, if, if I ever put on real time, my workouts, I would get nothing but made fun of online. Yeah. They're real and they're true. And I keep coming back. You know, one of the first articles I ever wrote about, I talked about my rule of five, how three workouts out of five are like, yeah, they're okay. One's pretty good. And one sucks. But when you work out a hundred times, there are 20 pretty good workouts of those four, five or even really damn good when you do a thousand workouts you know you know there's one or two or three that i write articles online about yeah yeah and people like the uh i think people like to look at the highlights you know yeah. it's, it takes a real fan to want to to want to look at all the details that led up to it it's that entertainment thing you know yeah. it's the oh. same i i think we're all guilty of it i you know i remember some years ago i put up an instagram post and it was me doing something crazy on some gymnastics rings. And then I was like, you know what? I think my next post, I'm going to post like all the missed attempts just for the heck of it. Why not? And it was popular because it was like, you know, I showed them this is what went into it. And it, what I was doing was not even Olympic gymnast quality. It was just, you know, a guy, a, yeah. a, a guy working out. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I, I think that's important. So not only can people see okay, I don't feel that bad that I can't do it. He, it took him five, 10 times before he got it. But uh, I think it also reduces their anxiety about trying to do something, knowing that they're going to fail. Because I think people take that failure pretty personally when the reality is, is like that's the majority of life is you're going to aim for a goal 
miss, and then you just have to recalibrate. So failure is not the end. It's just step two. And then you got to go for step three. Yeah. So, you know, I have a goal achievement on my website and course, and I, I'm not good enough. I wasn't clear enough that, you know, when if we have a track meet today, everyone who goes to the discus ring to throw probably wants to win. Everyone has the same or, or throw their best. Mm -hmm. We all basically have the same goal. But what makes people great is the systems they have and the 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 broader view. I mean, what I, I tell this story all the time. When I first met Coach Mon, I asked him what it takes to be an elite discus story. He said, lift weights three days a week. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Throw four days a week mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for the next eight years. And everybody misses that last little part. Yeah. Eight years part. You, you can't rush. Uh, there are goals you could rush. I don't know what they are. I mean, even pregnancy, man, it's 40 weeks. And thankfully, because it takes 40 weeks to emotionally prepare yourself to deal with uh, someone who's going to be in your life forever. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but uh, there's just very few things in life that are, uh, that the internet promises you know, instant gratification. Yeah. That's this. Sorry. I, I find our conversation interesting. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I think that this is, this is the other thing is that people realistically, people know all this stuff. Like I remember so they just don't contextualize it properly. So I'll give you an example. Many years ago, I was, uh, was very honored by having been given the task. I was tasked with, uh, doing a training session with a colleague's wife. So I had trained him. He was a physical therapist in Jerusalem, and he really loved the training that we were doing. He was feeling great. He was getting a lot stronger. And he said, well, you know, my wife is looking for some fitness advice. Would you be able to? And of course, you know, like your your wife or your husband or whatever, they're not going to listen to you. They're, they're going to listen to somebody else. And so he said, would you mind uh, doing a training session with her? So I said, yeah, absolutely. So uh, she met up with me. And uh, as we were talking, I asked, so what are, you know, what are some of the issues that you find? Because you mentioned you're having a hard time staying consistent. And she said, yeah, you know, I'm just a very all or nothing person, I guess. Like if I, if I can't do six workouts a week, or, and again, I'm paraphrasing, you know, then I, I, if I miss a workout or I miss two workouts, then I just, I just quit. I'm just a very all or nothing person. And I said, I don't think you are. I said, think about it like this. You got in your car to drive to train with me today. Did you tell yourself, all right, I'm going to drive 100 kilometers an hour all the way there. And if I have to slow down to take a corner, if I have to stop at a stop sign, then I'm just not going to show up and just going to park by the side of the road and it's over. She's like, no, I guess not. And I said, so I think, you know, the important thing is to see training is the same way is that there are going to be times when you can hit that 100 kilometers an hour. It's usually a very small part of the journey. You know, you've got to got to turn corners. You got to slow down. The speed limit changes. There are people in front of you. You know, there are people who are trying to merge. So you just have to respond to the obstacles the same way that you would while you're driving to whatever the destination may be. Uh, that's a great example. Are you in Jerusalem now? No, I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, a little different. Mid, yeah. Mid Midwest, not mid East. <laughs> yeah, a little different. Okay. Uh, yeah. And that, you know, I, I think back to when I first threw the discus, you know, you know, when I was about 13 or something like that and trying to throw 60 feet, you know, just over. And there was this line that was 60 feet and I just couldn't get it. And I would stay out there with poor Alan Albialda and I would say, how do you do that? And he would he just use. And then all of a sudden I threw 72. Then all of a sudden I threw 103, you know, and then when I was throwing just a couple of years later, 170 with the high school discus. I remember being in the same place and looking at the 60 foot line and going, how did I ever struggle with that? Well, because that is the way you do things. Mm -hmm. When you're trying to help your kids learn the alphabet or count or colors, you just kind of sit there and go, okay, one, two, three, four, five, 11. No, no. Okay. Six, six seven. And then, why when we work with children do we allow that time but when we work with our bodies we're like all or none one day yeah 
it boggles the mind you know and i think that's exactly it is the same it's that context thing is people are willing to see that that's the way that they have to do things for things that they don't view that they view outside of that sphere of entertainment and a lot of people i think do see training as being enter training you know they want oh. they, they want a level of fun and i think there is psychologically i think it does help if their trainer will give them some of that but mm -hmm. again it's it's got to be like the the cheese that's around the pill they've still got to show up they got to be consistent they got to do the fundamental movements uh so there is there's like there's a level of like having to meet them halfway so you can make things fun for them obviously yeah. but uh but I think that's what it is, is that people, when they have an emotional or an entertainment type attachment to whatever the activity is, suddenly they throw out the rule book that works for literally 100% of all things in their life. And uh, they want the they want the secret sauce or the special, you know, yeah. hack that's going to help them to surpass everything that they haven't been able to do so far. Yeah, I, I, this is great. I agree. Yeah. Now we just need to figure out how to solve that. That's the... <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, I have an inner circle, and that's one of the things we do. I mean, the most the most important thing, Alex, I think it, for me anyway, is to get clarity on what your personal values are, mm -hmm. and then number two, and easiest way to know how to get how, what your clarity is, I want you to think about two decades from now. What do you want to be two decades from now? So for me, that's eighty seven, and so you know. I still want to be working out two decades from now. I want to be financially sound two decades from now. I would like to keep on this rhythm of two book, uh, a book or two a year. Uh, I would like, you know, gosh, my, my daughter is going to be 54. You know, my grandkids are going to be in their thirties, you know, that's just having that thought for me clarifies what my values are. So, and, and so when I when I do work with people, if you give me time to work with you, I don't teach you the goblet squat day one. I mean, I, I will, but ideally I'll ask you, you know, what do you want 20 years from now? And usually it's, well, I don't care. I just want to look good for my reunion. And um, well, that's six weeks away. You waited until now. I, I don't know where my magic wand is, uh, but uh, I'll, yeah. I think I think when you have clarity on your values and when you have clarity on w what you want to be when you grow up, I think it helps a lot. Okay, enough of that. We can now that I've answered the questions for you. Let's move on. Let's move sure. on to our next, you next topic. I will, I'll, I will summarize real quick. I think that's a perfect example of again uh, integrating all of the stuff that's very important and not trying to isolate training. Uh, kind of like we talked about with the medical field, where sometimes people get so specialized that they don't talk between fields. That's a perfect way to look at it in terms of what you want personally, and then how is your training going to fit into that? Probably training 10 hours a day is not likely to be the, unless you're a boxer and you want to go all the way, or you're an Olympic lifter and you want to hit the Olympic gold. It's a, it's a point I make in this book that, you know, and I, I say this to my athletes all the time, and I, I used to get more pushback, but we're so successful now. It's not so bad. Mm -hmm. You, you, if you give me an hour a day as a high school athlete or a, you know, a division two uh, track and field athlete called college, I can do amazing things for you. Amazing. Well, what if I come and do two hours a day? No, make, go get, keep your academics up. But, but I really, no, the jump goes from one hour to 10. It's not, what you get from another hour of training a day isn't isn't double. It's yeah. it's a little bit. It's like adding cumin to a recipe. Yeah, it helps, you know, if it's a bean recipe. Um, but if you think the reason your Thanksgiving dinner failed is because you didn't have cumin, you 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 forgot the turkey, you didn't have mashed potatoes, and you didn't have cumin. Uh, it was the turkey and the mashed potatoes. That's we take care of those. Everything else takes care of itself. Hundred percent. Yeah, that was a very interesting revelation too. Because I, for the most part, I get kind of bored with my own training after like forty-five minutes. You know, sometimes yeah. whatever I've got on the list, it's like I got to go another fifteen minutes. Fine, yeah. but I, like I'm over the moon if I'm like, oh my god, I'm in and out and like I had a hill sprint workout the other day and I was done in like twenty-two minutes. I was like, this is great. Like, let me just go home and 
you know, not two hills anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. And, uh, and I think that a big part of, uh, a big part of the mistake that some people make now they they intuit one thing correctly which is that maybe i should be doing a little bit more than i'm doing now but a little bit will get you a lot farther provided you have not gone past the barrier where if you want to see the needle move yet again it has to become a full-time job and the 10-hour thing i thought was uh i had never thought about it like that before but it made perfect sense Oh, it, and some of those, it's in the book, folks. It's, uh, I talk about being an elite bodybuilder, you know, and I use the example of Frank Zane. And, and I only, I, I use Frank because, uh, I mean, I knew Dave Draper really well, uh, you know, uh, and uh, I've, met, I've met Arnold a couple of times, and, uh, but I've never met Frank Zane. I have seen him. I've been in the same gym with him, but I've never talked to him. But I just liked his style, and he was, you know, very, you know, he's very whole, you know, and, but to go from my, my idea of a half an hour to an hour a day to that level, it's not an extra hour. It's an extra nine hours a day yeah. or more so that you're weighing and you're measuring crap before you cook it. You know, you're, you know, you're looking at broccoli a completely different way than you used to look at broccoli. You're looking at food complete you're looking at you know i mean i've seen i've had friends of mine swallow there's a great video it's called the soul is greater my friend john powell's and it. it's on it's a great documentary about ricky brooke and he takes i think it's 432 pills a day wow like supplements yeah <laughs> probably looks pretty good uh it's just, it's a weird scene it's it my in fact i used to love listening to the kids groan during that scene when we show it at the discus camp, you know, Ugh! and that my point always was, listen, I'm trying to get you to train for an hour, two hours every day to get to 432 pills a day. That's a 10 hour commitment. Yeah. So, you know, when you say I'm all, all, all I think about is playing this game, basketball, whatever the game is, Okay, you can think about it, but are you imagine playing 10 hours a day of basketball? I mean, it would certainly, if it was serious, it would certainly make you a better player. It would also make it kind of hard to walk up flights of stairs when you're my age. Yeah. 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 That's the other thing is that um, I think, fortunately, you know, most of the people that we probably deal with on a regular basis in terms of fitness, they're, well, I take that back. You know, you've actually coached quite a few youngsters who, you know, they have yet to get to that experiential knowledge stage where they realize that maybe playing basketball for 10 hours a day or what have you might be a little bit of overkill and maybe they're just kind of enjoying themselves. But um, people do the same thing, I think, with uh, with their training where it's like, oh, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to try to do like two programs at the same time. Like I'm not getting strong enough on one, so I'll do two. Yeah. <laughs> it's my favorite diet. Uh, joke. Joke. My doctor put me on a diet, but it wasn't enough food. So now I'm on two diets. Yeah. <laughs> it's the it's, same idea. Sums you know? it up. Yeah. And uh, oh, when I see, I'll go to, I'll go to the forums, the kettlebell forums and stuff. And I'll see these people who are just so new to kettlebells and they're mixing. I'm going to do Pavel's uh, simple and sinister program and Dan John's ABC program. Good luck. Wow. You, I mean, you certainly can, but you know, when you add more crap to crap, it's still crap. Yeah. You know? And I think uh, I've heard it said very well that uh, a kitchen works best when there's just one chef. So yeah. I've had people ask me like, how would you change? Like, what would you add if you were doing, you know, Dan John's easy strength program or, or simple and sinister. Though I think there are some answers to it, but they have to be things that are complementary and not going to overload them. Like you do some crawling, some loaded carry. Those are things that you know could. You can add original strength to any program. Yeah, exactly. You can add flexibility at the end of any workout. You can add saunas, ice baths, and other recovery tools at the end of anything. But you got to be careful when you dose that stuff. Yeah, exactly. All about the dosage. Yeah. But if you're gonna if you're gonna do West Side 
Barbell Club and Marty Gallagher's powerlifting program and Easy Strain all at the same time, uh, I'm thinking something might, I just don't see how it's going to work. Yeah, it's like, I'll see you at the ER and then we'll talk about what you do next. I do like that for PR versus ER. That's pretty good. I like I, that. I wish I could say I, I invented it. Uh, one of my favorite, I I think you're familiar with um, the tight tan slacks of Dezoban. Oh my God. It's, it's one of the best websites on, on the planet. Yeah. I'm a huge fan. There's another one I'm a big fan of. Um, far more, uh, let's say, R-rated in terms of the the verbiage used in there and sometimes even some of the pictures. Just fair warning, but it's called plagueofstrength.com. Oh yeah, I know Plague of Strength. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I got PR or ER from Jamie Lewis of, of that website. Oh yeah, he is a very funny writer. He's, he's a talent. Yeah. Yes. He's, you know, what's funny is that I started writing, uh, I started reading, I read like almost all of his articles uh, years ago with the exception of the music related ones, just because, I mean, I, I absorbed all this great in training knowledge, but I was laughing so hard that it was just binge reading was just so easy, but he used to have a t-shirt that said PR or ER and he had to stop selling it. Cause I guess there was some physical therapist who had, something similar and who had just put this out like somewhat prior and was being rather litigious. So, um, but you know, you could still use the term but not have to worry about, you know, providing any royalties. So my favorite thing, my attorney ever told me, uh, I, I have a, you know, an attorney for books and stuff. Sure. If someone threatens to sue you, just say, where do you want the, where do you want the case to be? So I live in Utah, you're in Omaha. This isn't, you know, my publishing company is, in turkey mm -hmm. uh go ahead where by the time you guys figure out where we're going to hold the court case you're you're you've lost so much money yeah you know yeah okay i'm sorry folks that was a no i'm glad you mentioned that because i you know for instance i always uh i've got a couple books out and i'm always thinking like you know what would ever happen if somebody's like oh you didn't attribute this line to me or i said that and you know you didn't blah 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 so where do you want to hold the the court proceedings? That's smart. That's very smart. Well, I mean, you know, when I'll, every so often I'll, I'll someone will say they invented the goblet squat, and there's a kettlebell guy who said it, and it was kind of funny because he wasn't even doing kettlebells. Uh, the art, the first article on the goblet squats, two thousand three, two thousand four, and kettlebells were barely off the ground, and yeah. you know, and it was just funny to to see that. It's like, dude, I. I had 40 years in the weight room before you ever picked up a weight or yeah. whatever exaggeration you want. People love doing stuff like that. And, uh, and, uh, you know, being litigious, that's like an American pastime used to be, um, you know, apple pie, baseball now yeah. litigation, I think is largely the, the next big thing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've had a great conversation. I think to sum up one of the big things I would make sure people keep in mind is, what you talked about is uh, making your goals based around your values and not trying to separate those things. Hard, hard lesson I've learned in life. Yeah. You know, a couple of lessons in life, Alex, it, it's been tough for me. For, boundaries is a tough one, you know, oh, yeah. and I'm getting better at that. Um, and one of the problems with the internet is the internet, no one has boundaries. Uh, people, will, people will post things on Facebook that I'll look at and be like, do you have any? Do you have anybody in your life that just says that was a not a good idea? <laughs> yeah. Boundaries. Uh, people ask questions that are just shocking what people will say. Of course, you know, because you can be anonymous basically online. Yeah. Uh, Pavel, one of my favorite things, I said, yeah, this guy's talking crap about you, Pavel. And he goes, well, he would never say it to my face. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a good point. You know, all these superstar heroes. Uh, it is funny to meet these, uh, these uh, armchair experts. And I have a few times. Uh, I met this one guy who's on this one forum. He attacked everybody. I meet him in real life. And to say doughy is an a, offensive to every cookie and piece of bread ever made. Yeah. Uh, and yet he was an expert who probably couldn't bench, you know. A broomstick with a bagel on each end. Yeah, I, there you go. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Okay. I usually okay. use that to talk about my own somewhat lackluster bench pressing prowess. Is, uh <laughs> So, yeah, but it's yours to use. I think the rule is I get attribution twice and then a third time it's yours. That's my rule. Yes, that's a good rule. 
So yeah. now I bequeath it to you. You can you'd be more than happy to use that. <laughs> but yeah, I I find that too. I periodically like on YouTube, for instance, it's usually YouTube. I've had a couple people like respond to my emails with something, you know, like unfortunate. But it's a lot less common because there's usually a name attached, you know. Oh yeah, and if I have your email, I'll never stop bothering you. Yeah. Um, I uh, there was uh, there was one it was a you you know what was. This is a funny one. This happened maybe a couple of weeks ago. Uh, somebody, it started off very like, you know, conciliatory. Yeah. Seemed like he was a fan. He was like, hey, you know, ask a question, answer the question, post another comment. And then it's like, you can just sometimes just tell where things are going. He posted something like, uh, he's like, I think I figured out what you are. And I was like, oh boy, here we go. And I go, please enlighten us. And he goes, a tosser which I, I think is British slang for like a loser yeah. or something like that. Uh, I was yeah. like, delete, yeah. you know, like I'm not going to give you any more because I'll answer questions. I'll give responses, uh, but yeah. Oh, I had someone, uh, I had someone write on my YouTube channel that they deserve the, they have the right to find out what really happened with Tiffany. The right. Yes. That's in the constitution. You have the right to uh, all my bother. personal. Yeah. How ridiculous. Oh, I, I had a guy last week. I, there, I have a little thing. Somebody asked me, if you only have 20 minutes to do a workout, what you should do, writes in, you should read the Bible. So, you know, permanent, uh, whatever you can do on YouTube, uh, hide user from channel, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I, I had someone write the other day, Trump 2024, you know, per, you know, permanent, you know, permanent delete, you know, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You got to keep it relevant and you also have to be, and, be respectful. Keep that to people. crap off my stuff. I yeah. don't. Yeah. I've had the same. Well, I mean, it's also another funny thing. It's always like people will be like, this is my all time favorite. And this I see more frequently, not that much now, but used to see it a lot in the past. It was like, uh, yeah, you know, like commenting on an exercise video, like, yeah, you should do X, Y, Z to improve your whatever movement because you're not doing whatever. So I would always respond like, I'm having a hard time understanding what you're describing. Can, uh, can you point me to a video on your channel of you performing this? Yeah. And, you know, I'm not even being rude or anything like that, but it's like, it's either no response or there's some sort of like long explanation. Oh, you know, my cat just died and, uh, you know, oh, yeah. my camera just what? broke down. And so Amazon reviews that are negative are almost universally uh, anonymous accounts. Yeah. Uh, Someone didn't like my heart style kettlebell challenge book because uh, the rib cages of the models weren't right. And that, but see, that's a big knock. No, no offense. Kettlebell people, I love you. You guys have caused your own problems and it's not you, but you know what I'm talking about. Of course. This kettlebell psychosis. If you post a swing video, it's not so bad now, but yeah. 10 years ago, there would be, and I can tell you the names of the people years ago. And I, I know I've told you this story. I know I've told them Pat's all the time. So we're down in Orlando and I'm working with this guy and he's really struggling. The reason he's struggling is because he's a, a special forces guy from the United States. And he had shrapnel in his hamstrings because he had gotten blown up and he was a good guy. So a master walks over and goes, huh. There's some issues with that swing. I wouldn't pass them and then walked away. Now in 2024, I would beat you up for saying that. Yeah. Back then I was still trying, I was learning the ropes and thought a person like that didn't deserve such a slap, you know? Yeah. But that's just, it's the, the kettlebell community, We and I'm going to say the word we, we brought it on ourselves why people hate us. Yeah. I think the, the real issue it more than anything is that you've got you know glad handlers who want to try to make it they they want to try to get the validation or the pat on the head from the higher up or whatever like hey look what i said look what i did i'm doing and and so they they take what might start off as a good idea and or at least something that has contextually has some value and then they just turn it into some crazy monster like you know this is a perfect example actually is muscle building and this is you know, good topic for what we're talking about now. It, one of the things that was a real standout when Pavel put out uh, Power to the People was building strength without putting on muscle. Because at that time, it was like all strength training, I think was just kind of viewed as synonymous with bodybuilding. And he wanted to show people 
Oh yeah. So you can strength, you can get neural strength adaptations and you don't have to, and you don't have to spend all day in the gym. You don't need a whole ton of equipment. So, and so, but then people turned it into, ah, well, you know what? Training for muscle, that's unmanly. It's bourgeois. Dumbbells. Yes. Dumbbells. Yeah. And so it's like, no, there's a happy medium. And also if you're a kettlebeller and you're saying muscle is no good, people are going to say, oh, well, kettlebells can't build muscle because look at all these weeniest and, kettlebellers. And that is the problem. Did you hear what you just, because I, I hear both sides of this. Yeah. It's an either or response. Yeah. Which is the most element. This is what a, a two-year-old understands. Uh, this is the, uh, shoot uh this is Kohlberg you know this is level two this is low level thinking yeah either or and when I when I see I had to had to delete a family member but when I see that either or is nonsense I just think to myself god you gotta move beyond that level you know I'm not saying you have to become a mother Teresa I'm not saying you have to become a Nobel Peace Prize winner but for god's sakes Learn to have that balance and that tension in your head. And most people really struggle to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the, I, you know, I've been listening a lot lately to um, The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. My God, what a great uh, Earl Nightingale. Uh, I have several of his books behind me. Um, yeah. Uh, you, you always win when you talk about Earl Nightingale with me. Yeah. I, I think Earl Nightingale... Um, a lot of those early, we'll call, I guess, call it self-development. Again, that's also managed yeah. to get like kind of a negative connotation, but people uh -huh. understand what I mean. Um, it, just so much common sense, you know, like this is, and, and similarly, I have to say, this is one of the things that I really like about uh, a lot of your books and armor building formula in particular is that when it's necessary, you talk about scientific studies, like, you know, the value of walking, and whether it's correlation or causation, that's actually, you know, people walk a lot, live longer. Is it because they're healthy, so they walk a lot? Or do they walk a lot and that makes them healthy? But more than anything, I think there's so much focus on, well, what does the research show? It's like, are you sure that whatever somebody tells you it shows is something that if you if you knew how to read the research, you'd be able to, and this is that informational knowledge versus experiential knowledge. And people uh, balk at experience in many cases now, because they want, well, you know, what does the research show? It's like, if you can't read what the research shows to begin with, then what difference does it make? You know? And why waste my time with the research? They just did a study on, uh, oh, it was like, it, 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 I'm not going to go in. I don't want to. There was 12 people in the study. It's not, it's, it's not statistically significant. Another study. There was 14. New Z they're called NZOs, New Zealand obese. It's a, it's a kind of rat, a uh, kind of mouse mm -hmm. that is bred so that it becomes fat very easy. And they found no differences between these two uh, dieting things. Well, who cares about 12 mice? I mean, yes, God bless the mice. Yes. You know, all that, um, uh, there's that great, the study, the study they did on chimpanzees and they found directly opposite things. Then you find out that the chimpanzees at the one place ate junk food and the chimpanzees at the other place helped, uh, ate a healthy diet. So the two, you can't compare the two studies. Yeah. Holy, okay. You know what um, we need to do? We need to write a book of 12 mice and men and it's going to be all about- 12 angry mice and men. 12 angry yeah. mice and men. There we go. Yes. Yes. Hey, I, I'm i going to have to leave in a few. Okay, I just- oh, sure. Sorry, I'm getting the warning signs from my dogs. So ah, uh, yes, okay. They yes. they can't be made to wait. They've got they've got their needs. So we could go on for ages and hours. No, let's, just, let's just do it again. Absolutely, let's do it again. I will uh, I mean, reach next, out to you shortly after week, this and two weeks or something like yeah, that. And absolutely, come back. Uh, you got great questions. Thank you kindly. Thank you. And we had a great conversation. I think uh, if people yeah. leave with nothing else, they're going to leave with a better and deeper understanding of what it's going to take to do what they really want to do, which is to be healthy for the rest of their hopefully very, very long lives. And, uh, and I appreciate you talking about the new book uh, a lot. And it, I think one of the things I want the, the listeners to come away with is that this idea that, you know, you can achieve your fitness goals in a reasonable, simple way 
And you, you don't have to just study what, you know, okay, God bless Mr. Olympia and Ms. Olympia and Ms. America and all the others. Good for them. But for most of us, we don't have the DNA and the time and the resources to pull that off. So, you know, let's let's get back to, to feel good, look good, move good, you know. Exactly. I'd point yeah. out, too, that in the case of those really high athletes, we also only have CVS as our pharmacy, and they tend to have a little bit better pharmacological assistance in some cases. Well, and if you don't think drugs are involved, you, you're just, yeah. And and let's be honest, you've been to search, haven't you? You know, oh, and, you know, people showing up and they're just, you know, ripped and chiseled and very often can't handle the three day cert because they they don't have the resources, you know, to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. That's all, all show, no go, as they say. Yeah. So where can people find you online? I want if anybody who is listening is sure. not following Dan, we need to rectify that immediately. So I have a website called uh, danjohnuniversity.com. You can get my books there danjohnuniversity.com slash bookstore. I have a YouTube called uh, Dan John Strength Coach, maybe. And then I'll I have it up and put them in the description. And then I have Coach Dan John over there at Instagram, okay? Fantastic. Um, you know, I'm still on Facebook, but I, I struggle with it, you know. It's um, crappier than it used to be. It used to be a blast, and now it's like. Oh, just, just so aggressive. I can't, I can't stomach it. Yeah. I, I, you know, and. You know, when I was young, we used to say you don't go to parties and talk about politics, religion, and sports. And um, I that just doesn't exist anymore in America. Uh, when I was growing up, you would never put a sign on your lawn for a political candidate ever. That was just not something done in my neighborhood. Yeah. And now uh, there'll be signs. People keep these signs on their for, forever. Uh, I don't know. It scares me. It scares me, but it, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. But the important part is that we can't change that, but you can change how you look and feel. Dan John can help you with that. He's got the experiential and informational knowledge you need. Check him out. Again, go to the resources in either the show notes or the description, depending on where you are consuming this delicious episode. Thank you. Appreciate that. Of course. Of course. And uh, Dan, we'll do this again very soon. I hope so. And it's always it's always good to see you. I mean, it's always good to talk to you. And gentle listeners, we actually do know each other. So uh, so he's 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 been close enough to smell me. So that's a he's a brave man. So. At the end of a long workshop, too. And I would say the same thing because I was the one being put through the workout. So it's, uh, <laughs> you know, a little bit of that mutually assured destruction, I guess you would call it. That's right. Hey, you're, you're the best. Let's talk in a couple of weeks. OK, sounds good. Take care. We'll talk soon.